Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 455th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Hey there, this is Janice, the Urban Farm Podcast Manager, and I'm excited about the new growth in our farms and gardens everywhere I turn, and I love that we get to be a part of it. For helping us all in our goals to grow our own food, we are grateful to our sponsors, Lacrosse Boots and Gemplers. Let them know you appreciate it too, and check out their websites for some great farm products. I learned a long time ago that having good tools supports my dedication to being a lazy gardener. Along the way, I've always looked for the best, most innovative products that are fairly priced and sold by a company that treated me like I matter. That is why I'm so excited to find Gemplers. They've been around since 1939 when they started selling tires to farmers. Still located in Wisconsin, they take pride in finding the highest quality product to make your hardest outdoor jobs easier. Gemplers offers thousands of products to help you with your urban farming and gardening projects, tools that pave the way for greater harvests. Over the next few months, I will be reviewing some of my favorites and adding them to my very own page on their website. Kempler's is dedicated to being the best place you've ever shopped, treating you like a neighbor. Whether you're a business owner or a passionate hobbyist, please accept my invitation to get acquainted with them. They've even set up a special offer for Urban Farm podcast listeners. Enter Urban Farm 01 to save 20% on your first order. Visit gemplers.com forward slash urban farm to make your gardening and farming chores that much easier. At La Crosse Boots, we salute the land, the rolling acres you've come to know like the back of your own hands, the fertile soil where your family has grown and your everyday moments have blossomed into everlasting memories. For this land is your land, your bedrock, your private parcel of earth that keeps you firmly grounded to what truly matters most. Lacrosse Boots, done right since 1897. Visit us at lacrossefootwear.com to find a dealer near you. Today on our podcast, we have someone who creates healing tonics from common and locally foraged plants. We're talking with Devin Young about medicinal remedies. Devin is founder of the holistic lifestyle blog Nitty Gritty Life, is a trained herbalist, and is well practiced in developing and implementing herbal remedies. She has a degree in complementary and alternative medicine from the American College of Healthcare Sciences and is the author of The Backyard Herbal Apothecary, which I have a copy sitting right in front of me. It's a beautiful book. Welcome to the show today, Devin. Are you ready to rock? I absolutely am. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Sure. I come from a large family that is based here in the Willamette Valley, which is the western part of Oregon. And I come from a family that is is very plant-based, a long line of farmers on my mother's side. And so I've always been gardening. I've always spent time with plants. I've always really enjoyed being outside in nature, growing my own food and growing my own herbs. I spent my early adulthood working in a couple of different industries, namely the cosmetic industry and then the wine industry for a while, uh, which may seem very divergent, but actually the cosmetic companies I worked for were very natural based. And so that kind of piqued some of my interest in um, natural approaches to skincare. And then of course, in the wine industry, I was working every day with with plants themselves. But it wasn't until my late 20s and early 30s when I started to suffer from some pretty serious health concerns. And I wasn't really finding a path to wellness with the conventional Western medicine. My diagnoses were, they were confusing. There was a lot of just offering me medications that had a lot of side effects Mm -hmm. and I I wasn't getting better. And so I started to turn to herbs 
to kind of regulate my my health and to find a, a path to wellness. And it started very simply with working with nettles, with working with anti-inflammatory herbs, and slowly but surely, a lot of my major health concerns started to resolve. It's amazing how that happens, isn't it? Yes. Taking a slow, thoughtful, measured approach to one's wellness can really transform your health if you're patient. Cool. So you've put this all together in a book, The Backyard Herbal Apothecary, Effective Medicine Remedies, Effective Medicinal Remedies Using Commonly Found Herbs and Plants. How did you get to writing a book about this? Well, I started my blog, Nitty Gritty Life, a few years ago back and I was really focused on talking about medicinal herbs, how to grow plants and, you know, feed your family and take care of yourself. And then I found that people were really hungry for more information about medicinal herbs and how to use them. When I was first learning about herbs, I found very few books that provided a deep dive into common everyday herbs. A Mm -hmm. lot of them had very specialized herbs or sometimes the information wasn't very deep. And so with Backyard, I chose to take 50 very common herbs that we see all over most temperate landscapes, particularly those here in North America, do a deep dive on the medicinal uses, the therapeutic actions of those herbs how to grow them, how to identify them, and then how to produce safe, effective home remedies from those herbs. Wow. So, you know, in thumbing through this book, you have you call out chickweed, which yes. I, I know I've heard of it before. It's a weed that grows in my yard. Didn't know that it yes. was medicinal. Tell me about that. It's medicinal and edible. It is what we kind of refer to as like one of those spring tonic herbs. It is considered a bitter bitter green, but it's not overtly bitter, but it has a lot of actions on the digestive system. It helps the kidneys start to really get rid of the excess toxins in the system. And when I say, you know, detoxifying, I don't mean that that really over-commercialized version of detoxifying. Our body detoxifies all of the time. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, especially after winter, especially after we've been kind of sedentary, probably eating starchier foods, maybe making not the the best health choices, chickweed and similar herbs are going to reinvigorate our body's detoxification processes and just help us feel lighter, more healthy, and really kind of give us more energy and make our bodies feel healthier. Wow, cool. You said 50 different varieties of plants that just grow in our backyards? Oftentimes, yes. Most of of the herbs or the botanicals that I mentioned are very common to most temperate climates. Some are are even shrubs that you might see planted in um, municipal plantings like Oregon grape, very common throughout the United States because it's adaptable to a variety of conditions. But then common weeds like chickweed, like dandelion, those are something people see all the time, every day, and they don't even recognize that it's there and useful as, as food and medicine. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, that's the big thing. We need to start paying attention to what's growing on in our, growing on in our own space. Absolutely. So what's your favorite herb to grow? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) There are so many herbs that I love to grow. I think one of the most important things for a a home gardener and a home herbalist is to plant plants that do well for your area that have a multitude of uses. So oftentimes I really like to plant herbs that have both of a a culinary aspect and Mm. a medicinal aspect. Mm -hmm. So your, your basil, your thyme, your dill, fennel, uh, calendula, which is gorgeous, you know, daisy-like flowers, chamomile, all these that have both 
visual appeal, culinary appeal, and and then they're medicinal as well. And they just get bonus points if they look gorgeous in the landscape. Right. Because everybody wants a pretty yard or a pretty patio. And I really think that you can have a, a beautiful environment as well as as growing your own food and medicine. Yeah. And so that's growing your own. Now let's let's shift over into the forage. So foraging is really about going out there and finding out what's out there. So what's your favorite herb or plant to forage? I would have to say my, I probably have two. I love foraging for stinging nettle, which is probably something nobody has ever said on your podcast before because it stings, It stings, right? right. Yep. But it is an amazing herb uh, for overall health. It dials down allergenic responses, Mm -hmm. and it made a huge change in my own personal health using, using nettle regularly. It does require that you wear long sleeves and gloves. But it usually comes up in late winter, early spring, throughout spring. And after I've spent a winter pretty much stuck inside because it rains a lot here in Oregon, I am always really thirsty to get out, get moving, and stinging nettles provide that opportunity uh, to get out and forage. Another uh, herb that I love to forage, and again, this is another one in late winter, early spring, is cottonwood. And cottonwood grows anywhere close to waterways. It likes wet, damp mm-hmm. roots. And cottonwood buds are beautifully aromatic, and they're a very, it's a sticky mess to forage for them, but having a house filled with drying cottonwood buds is absolute heaven. The scent is amazing. So you've suggested two of them, stinging nettles and cottonwood. Both are a little bit problematic to get a hold of. (laughs) They are, but once you learn how to forage Uh for them and forage properly, taking just a few, uh, you know, key ideas uh, into account, they're extremely easy to identify. They're easy enough to gather and forage. They're usually quite abundant, and they're both very sustainable. Nettle is going to come back if you cut it back, uh, so it's it going to keep replenishing. Mm-hmm. Cottonwood usually, because the, the the branches themselves are quite brittle, you can harvest cottonwood buds from windfall. So it's one of the most sustainable oh, wow. ways to gather medicine is you're, you're gathering from branches that are already down on the ground. Yeah. You're not taking from a living tree. And that's one of my, my missions as an herbalist, as a forager, is to make as little impact on the environment as I can. I, w- I want to leave it as nice as I found it. Mm-hmm. And why is that important? Because we need to take care of our earth. We need to take care of the environment around us so it stays renewable, so it becomes sustainable. Because if everybody goes out and starts ripping out plants by the root, cutting things back to the ground, Mm -hmm. then it's not available for others. It destroys the natural environment, and it, it changes the habitat around us. Yeah, very good. And what is your favorite plant that has made the biggest impact for you personally? Again, I'm, I'm probably going to circle back to nettle here because my own personal experience with, with health concerns were very allergy related. I suffer from adrenal fatigue. And um, to be very clear, I was becoming quite sick uh, Mm. in my later 20s and early 30s. I went as far as to go into anaphylactic shock more than a handful of times. Wow. And really the only thing that was keeping me from going into anaphylactic shock was taking steroids. And those have, well, they're a fantastic medicine when you need them. And for that emergency need, they don't have a great long-term usage. There's a lot of side effects. And so when I started using nettle, I was slowly able to return my adrenal system to a, a healthier state and In doing so, I also was able to dial down my hay fever and seasonal allergies. 
so it was pretty, you know, remarkable for me to be able to find wellness in a, a variety of different aspects of my life through the use of, of nettle. That was really the, my, my gateway herb, the herb that said, okay, you need to do this. You need to help others find, find a path with, with herbs. Mm-hmm. So I have a uh, pooch, a year and a half old red healer. And about three months ago, it's springtime, and about three months ago, it looks like she got hit pretty hard with weepy eyes and, uh, you know, and her energy hasn't been all that strong. So I'm wondering if nettles might help that. It's an allergy. I would say using steamed nettles in her food, you don't want to to serve her raw nettles because they still have the sting, but yep. once they have been steamed or heated in some way, that kind of neutralizes the the sting. But doing some steamed nettles and mixing that in with her, with the, if you do meat or raw meat, that mm-hmm. may help to kind of dial back her allergies. I would maybe suggest adding some turmeric as well because that will reduce inflammation over time as well. And when you have allergies, oftentimes you have associated inflammation as well. And so when you approach allergies, you have this heightened immune response and then also approach it from an inflammation standpoint, you tend to find really good results. Nice. And now we're not just talking about dogs. We're talking about people too. Dogs and people. Allergies and inflammation go hand in hand. Perfect. And your favorite home remedy? Oh, goodness. Probably elderberry tincture. We use elderberry tincture in our household all the time to keep everybody feeling well, supporting wellness. I would rather prevent illness if I can or support the immune yeah. system so that it has a, a less dramatic response to becoming ill. And so elderberry is really my, my go-to herb. Uh, I have a large family, and so I pretty much just, you know, meter out the doses of, <laughs> of elderberry syrup and or elderberry tincture from mm-hmm. about September to, well, you know, about this time of year. You mentioned... And when we started talking that you worked in the cosmetic industry. Now, I know that a lot of cosmetics are highly toxic. What do my listeners need to know about cosmetics? Well, there's a lot of wonderful cosmetics and skincare companies out there that are really doing an excellent job at at providing natural and, and healthy skincare products. But there's a lot that are really just concerned about their bottom dollar when I'm looking at a cosmetic product, I, I tend to look at the ingredients label. And when you see an abundance of ingredients, when you're, there's 50, 60 different ingredients listed on the back of a cosmetics bottle, that raises a lot of alarm bells to me because I don't know what kind of ingredients are in, are in there. You know, if they have hormone disruptors, if there are things that I or my loved ones are going to be allergic to because there's so many layers of ingredients to sift through there. When you tend to find companies that are producing natural skincare products and when you make them yourselves, you're looking generally at a very, very short ingredients list. And so if you have a reaction to something, you can probably figure out what it is that's bothering you and adjust your recipe accordingly or choose a different, uh, a different brand. And then you'll have that information and you'll know what upsets your skin or what upsets your system because you can easily identify it from the list of ingredients because it's not 50, 60 ingredients long. Right. Beautiful. So let's talk about tinctures and extracts. What's the difference between them? Uh, this is one of my favorite questions because it seems so confusing. You see some things as extracts and, and some things as tinctures. What a tincture is, well, let me back up. A tincture is an extract, but not all extracts are tinctures. So how's that for being confusing? <laughs> right. So tinctures are generally made by infusing an herb into 
alcohol, sometimes vinegar, sometimes glycerin, but mostly we're referring to an alcoholic extraction. That's what a tincture is. But an extract itself, there's a variety of different types of extracts, and I could go into a bunch of them, but they're super sciencey and not something that we can achieve at home. Like you probably don't have the ability to do a CO2 extraction in your kitchen, but you probably have a jar and access to 100 proof spirits and some herbs where you can make a tincture. Ah, perfect. And uh, you have a basic herbal tincture or extract that we can make at home? So in the book, I discuss a lot about different tincture making strategies. Mostly what you're doing when you're making a tincture is you're going to infuse an herb into, in this case, I mostly use alcohol for about four to six weeks, sometimes longer. And you really can infuse tinctures as long as you would like. They will only become stronger or more potent but they won't ever become so potent that they're unusable. When I infuse the alcohol with the herbs, I generally use four to five parts of alcohol per one part of herbs. So if I'm using cottonwood buds, Mm -hmm. for example, then I might use one cup of cottonwood buds to about four or five cups of alcohol. And funny, I chose cottonwood buds uh, as that example because that is an example of an herb that I would actually choose a a higher proof alcohol with cottonwood buds because they're highly resinous. It really takes something like Everclear, which is about 190 proof, Proof, to extract all of those medicinal um, constituents from from the herb itself. So when I am considering what type of alcohol to use in a tincture, I look at the substance. If it is very light, if it is highly aromatic, if the texture is is fragile on that herb, I will probably use 80 proof alcohol, generally unflavored vodka. If it's a little bit sturdier plant material, um, you know, thicker leaves and seeds that are are not terribly hard, then I, I would use 100 proof. I, I really, 100 proof is my go-to proof uh, of spirits to use for tincture making. But when something is a very, a very hard substance or a, um, a very resinous substance, that's when I would use the higher proof, 190 proof alcohols to get a good extraction. And really for about four to six weeks, I would allow that to steep in a jar in a cool, dry place. And that is, that's my folk method for making a good tincture at home. And that's super, super, super simple. Yes, it is. It's, you can overthink tincture making and basically any remedy making. People tend to overthink it. And I, I call it like the overthinking paralysis. It's really so much more simple. And you just need to get in and start doing, and then you start to gather your own knowledge about what you like and what works for you. Yeah. I tell people about gardening here in Phoenix. It's one great big grand experiment. I can tell you what I know, but then you got to go figure it out on your own. Absolutely. My listeners know that I have Lyme. I'm pretty vocal about it just because of how Lyme lives as a conversation in our culture. So I like to uh, share as much as I can about it. And I know that there's some some herbs and tinctures that will positively impact that. Can you share about one of them maybe? Yes. Actually, Japanese knotweed is a weed that herbalists turn to when we have um, concerns of Lyme disease with our clients. Japanese knotweed is an invasive plant to most of North America and Europe. In its native area, which is Eastern Asia, there's predation, there's grazing, the things that would naturally keep that plant in check. It is that that does not occur in Western Europe and in uh, North America. And Japanese knotweed can absolutely get out of control very, very quickly. 
So this is a great herb to turn to because we can use this. We can aggressively harvest this herb Mm -hmm. and, and use it for our Lyme disease suffering clients. It is very specific against the type of bacteria and the co-infections that Lyme disease sufferers deal with. And it is part of a larger protocol um, from an herbalist uh, named Stephen um, Bruner. Mm -hmm. And it's just a wonderful herb for folks that are suffering from Lyme disease. Again, nothing changes overnight. This is part of a larger protocol to support wellness and to give the body a chance to fight back against Lyme disease, but it is a highly effective herb. Nice. And so you share a lot of this on your blog, I suspect. Can you tell us about your blog? Yes. Nittygrittylife.com is really dedicated to all matters of holistic and sustainable living. Uh, A lot of what I write about on the blog is herbs. So I write about the medicinal uses and the therapeutic actions of herbs. I write a lot about how to grow and forage for those herbs as well. But I also touch on gardening, homesteading, and cooking from scratch. Nice. So your book is called The Backyard Herbal Apothecary, Effective Medicine Remedies Using Commonly Found Herbs and Plants by Page Street Publishing. It was available in April of this year, 2019, and is packed to the brim with information on 50 different plants, recipes, for 56 remedies and beautiful photography, which I am told you did most of the photography? Yes, I did. Photography was something I've just really picked up in the last few uh, years, more out of necessity, and certainly wasn't from any innate skill. So I've been teaching myself photography and watching a lot of how-to photograph YouTube videos (laughs) for the last for the last few years, it is now a great enjoyment of mine to be able to photograph plants, but trying to get Mother Nature to behave when you're trying to <laughs> right. take a picture of a plant, yeah. is, is that is that's difficult. I live in a windy area. Plants don't stand still. They're worse than children. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Well, I'll tell you, the book is beautiful and the photography is stunning. I wouldn't have guessed that you're a... Uh, uh, new photographer. So congratulations on that. I know putting out a book as always Thank takes you. a lot of lot of effort and it's quite fulfilling. So congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you learned from it. So I've probably had a lot of failures in life, but really specific to my life as an herbalist is the tendency to go overboard to take on too many projects, to to use too many herbs, and to suffer from that overwhelm. Mm. I think that when we use too many herbs, we can't identify what is working and what is not. When we take on too many projects, we can't be successful in any one of those because our attention is spread too thin. So, In the last few years, I've really tried to take on only the projects I know I can dedicate my energy to and and see it all the way through. And then when I'm working with clients, when I'm working with my family, when I'm writing remedies, I don't want to overcomplicate those remedies. I want to make sure that we can look at the remedy and figure out what makes it work or what is making it not work because as an herbalist, finding what doesn't work is just as important as what does work because yeah. everybody's an individual. Yep. I found that specifically with Lyme is oh, that, yeah. you know, Lyme patients, uh, we all get treated differently because the remedies are so much different for everybody. And the, the other thing I've noticed is that I, I have to do really one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. and see how it works. Because yeah. if, if I start stacking too many things, like one day, a couple of weeks ago, I ate a couple of pieces of bread, which I know better than that, and I had sugar the same day. So I didn't know whether it was the sugar or the bread or both or neither. <laughs> yeah, so. there's. I always suggest to people, to, when they're, especially when they're starting with herbs, to take things slow. You know, Don't go out 
and spend, you know, fifty, sixty, a hundred dollars on a variety of herbal remedies, pick one or two and start integrating them slowly. And then we can address in a couple of weeks, okay, hey, what's working? What's mm-hmm. not working? And then build on that because when you just throw the kitchen sink at a problem, your results are almost always lackluster, if not a complete and utter travesty. So what do you consider your biggest success? Other than having a happy, healthy family, I think that my biggest success is really having a platform to reach people that want to learn more about herbs, to learn more about homesteading and growing and foraging for their own plants and cooking from scratch. I feel incredibly blessed, and I think that's an overused word, but I am blessed to have on all the different social media and platforms I have some of the most amazing people in my audience that are there to support me, to support each other, and that share knowledge pretty freely, and and they're nice about it, which Mm -hmm. is just something so wonderful in in a society where everybody has, has an opinion and apparently has an attitude. I'm just really lucky to have an audience, to have grown an audience that is kind and knowledgeable and willing to help each other and be supportive. So, so important. And that's that's really the only place I play anymore is let's be kind and generous and have fun. Yes. So what drives you? I think one of my biggest driving factors in what I do is to provide people with the information that I know so that they can have more information, be armed to make good decisions for their own family, for their own wellness. I don't claim to know all the answers, but I do want to share everything that I know so that people have that information. Again, we're all individuals and finding what works for each one of us is very individual process. And I'm more than happy to to share that information so that so that others, for that, so that my children and eventual grandchildren have choices in their own wellness. Amen to that. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Oh my goodness. That is, again, kind of like asking me to pick which is my favorite child. I have a lot of books, but <laughs> <Right>? probably, <laughs> probably my most dog-eared and tired-looking book is currently The Earthwise Herbal Repertory by Matthew Wood. It is a it's more a formulary that was put together for more uh, advanced herbalist, but I find that the way he breaks it down is exactly extremely easy to process. He talks about a particular complaint or disorder, say indigestion, and then I'll have a list of maybe 50 different herbs that address complaints of indigestion. So for me, I can open up that book and I can look at any one of the herbs in there and say, oh, you know what? I want to learn more about fennel or I want to learn more about dill and how that might help my indigestion. And the whole book is like that. It's just a wonderful formulary, wonderful list of really amazing herbs. And then you can grow your knowledge from that list, from that formulary. Cool. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Probably my biggest advice to listeners would be to take it slow and to trust your intuition when you are using herbs. You're, you know your body better than anybody else. And so if you tap in to your sense of self, you can gather a lot of information and make more in, informed health decisions and wellness decisions for yourself. Trust your instincts. Trust your knowledge. Trust that you know your body and your needs better than anybody else, better than me, better than your doctor. Trust you know yourself. You. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Devin. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? How can we find you? So the variety of different ways. My website is nittygrittylife.com. If you would like to contact me specifically about anything that we discussed on the podcast today, you can use the About and Contact form. You can find me on Facebook, 
at Nitty Gritty Life Holistic and Sustainable Living with Devin Young. And on Instagram, I'm at Nitty Gritty Mama. And those are probably the easiest ways to get a hold of me. Beautiful. Beautiful. And we also want to thank Devin and the folks over at Page Street Publishing as we've got five copies of the Backyard Herbal Apothecary that need a new home. And we want to share them with our listening audience. To enter the sweepstakes, send an email with your name and mailing address to podcast at urbanfarm.org with the subject, there is an herbal remedy in my backyard. We will pick five random emails from the first 50 people who respond during the giveaway. There's a link to the rules for our giveaways that can be found on the show notes page of today's podcast. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash nitty gritty. We are your urban farming resource. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts are found. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. At La Crosse Boots, we salute the land, the rolling acres you've come to know like the back of your own hands, the fertile soil where your family has grown and your everyday moments have blossomed into everlasting memories. For this land is your land, your bedrock, your private parcel of earth that keeps you firmly grounded to what truly matters most. For it is the land of bonfires that torch a night sky, the land of dirt-flinging afternoons that wash away everything but the here and the now. The land where you plant seeds of strength and promise, of faith and togetherness. And so, with rubber on foot and pride in soul, you work the land, you play the land, proudly honoring the timeless agreement that by always nurturing the land, it will forever return the favor. Lacrosse Boots, done right since 1897. Visit us at lacrossefootwear.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.